today we're going to talk about what I consider to be the biggest threat to sports card collecting as we know it. This will sound a little bit doom and gloom, and it is things we've touched on before. But there's a few things that have popped off in recent weeks that I think would serve as a really good discussion point to cover this once again. And it does, in fact, relate to repacks. It does, in fact, relate to government regulation when it comes to these breaking platforms. And I'll unpack exactly what I mean throughout this process because you, know, you guys would have heard me speak about this a lot, but I think it's an important one to touch on again, like I said. Now, the reason why I want to talk about this is because Mike Geo from Sports Card Nonsense did a bit of a debate with Cage Lawyer on his Instagram a few weeks ago. And there's some comments made there around, you know, what Fanatics is maybe doing in the background. And this was purely hearsay. There was no factual information there or anything like that around the whole threat of government intervention. Now, I've talked about this before when it comes to government stepping in, because essentially breaking in these Fanatics live platforms and whatnot and all that sort of stuff is essentially gambling, right? And it's always left me a bit perplexed as to how this sort of stuff has been allowed to slip through the cracks, especially when you think of, you know, what kind of vetting these companies do to actually make sure the people that are using the platform are of legal age and all that kind of stuff, right? And my mind has always gone to the thought process of, well, now that Michael Rubin has come in, he's placed such a magnifying glass on this industry and he's trying to elevate it up. Is the government at some capacity going to step in to say, you know what, this stuff is gambling, this needs to be regulated, we need our cut. And, you know, whether you agree with that or not, governments like to do that because they like to tax revenue. So my mind sort of always went down that path. And the reason why this is interesting is because of the whole repack situation. You know, we touched on this, you know, a week or so ago around how repacks are quite a slippery slope for this industry. And it seems like very much so that the repacks are one of the things giving a lot of liquidity to the market. And Mike and Cage actually did discuss this as well. And I commented at the time that it's, you know, very scary liquidity because you've basically got these repackers going around and clearing out tables. And there are a lot of card show vlogs, there's a lot of commentary on social media about this in the US, where these guys at the end of the show, or sometimes even at the start of the show, will go around and pick up essentially everything, buy up people's tables. And this is coming up to a volume that people are actually noticing and paying, you know, 100% comps, 90% comps, sometimes over comps to get these cards to then put into repacks. And when you sit back and think about, well, okay, people are saying that sort of stuff is happening all over the country. If repacks were to sort of disappear overnight, that, that's quite a scary thing for, you know, card collecting because these guys, you know, as many have attested to, are giving a lot of liquidity to the market. These guys are going out and buying entire tables. So if all of a sudden these people aren't there, who's going to be buying the inventory that these people are pricing? It probably means not as many people, which means prices will need to come down and then it's sort of like a domino effect on the way down. And that is going to be nothing new. We've touched on that before. But the reason why I think this is interesting is the whole regulation aspect, the government intervention when it comes to these platforms. Because you've got all these breakers, like I said, and these repackers going to shows and buying out inventory, and then something happens overnight where a switch is flicked and all of a sudden these you know platforms now need to try, start treating this stuff as gambling. They need to start you know vetting the, the onboarding of customers onto their platform a lot better, i.e. you have to prove your identity, send in you know, driver's licenses, passports, whatever it is to prove that you're of legal age. Is that going to kill the volume for the demand of these repacks? Is that going to disappear overnight? Because guess what? A lot of these people you know, that were buying into this stuff were of the younger audience. You know, Maybe, maybe not, but that's sort of where my mind goes with this stuff. And I really want to hear what you guys have to say down below because it's a constant message that we're sort of seeing that repackers are fundamentally the people that are propping up the liquidity of these shows, propping up and buying all this sort of stuff. And without them, it's not going to be as frequent. That scares me quite a lot. And I made the reference in, in the last video on this topic about, you know, looking to the GFC in 2008, 2009 around, you know, mortgage-backed securities and CDOs and all that kind of stuff. And what sort of happened in that instance was you had brokers and banks giving out loans to people they shouldn't have. And then the debt associated with those loans was then unsold. Basically, the profits of that interest income on those mortgages were being sold down the line. And eventually, more and more of these things kept getting muddied together. It came a very dodgy situation. You guys, you can, you know, would have known well full about it. I don't need to talk about it because it is quite common knowledge, but it eventually resulted in a situation where okay, people weren't making money anymore because the demand wasn't there, the things weren't worth what they were paying, and the whole market turned to shit. And it sort of all stemmed from the fact that people were essentially writing mortgages to people they shouldn't have. Yes, you know, repacks operate slightly differently in the sense that you're getting a card and it's not necessarily operating in the same way, but when you look at it down the path of you know, repackers buying cards from people that are, you know, maybe overpriced, right? Because they're the only ones buying them. They then go into a product, that product gets hit, person gets the card, the card's not worth what they paid for it. And then it just keeps repeating this cycle. And because repackers keep paying essentially over comps is what some people are sort of saying, um, that just gap gets bigger and bigger between what the repack is actually worth and what the card itself is actually worth. And if that gap continues to get bigger, that's going to be a bit of a bubble there. 
And I don't think anyone can safely say that it's not a bubble. And it's just one of those things, right? If you've got more people coming into the hobby, sure, that's going to help with the demand and the supply and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, that element really scares me. It's why I think it's, you know, a very scary piece of liquidity, why it can't be trusted. Because a, a switch could flick overnight, like I said, and that stuff would immediately be worthless. Like that gap is getting bigger between what the repack is actually worth and what the card is. And it comes down to what the end consumer actually wants. I've referenced this before as well, and I'm going on a tangent now, but you know, we compared sports cards to luxury watches over the last two years, and we sort of saw what was happening in watches and, and where price points got pushed because basically watches were getting flipped between flippers, and it really wasn't ending up in the hands of the person that actually wants to own that watch long term. You know, you look at a Rolex Submariner, they, I think, retail for, you know, $13,000 Australian. They got pushed up to like $35,000 Australian. Yet the person that actually wants to buy it and own it long term is not going to pay thirty five grand, which is why we saw prices come down so quickly. You're sort of seeing the same thing with cards, and we sort of, sort of saw the same thing with cards, you know, after the, the COVID boom where, you know, all of a sudden a card that was selling for a thousand bucks is now selling for a hundred or less. It's like, well, people aren't going to pay that thousand. And that gap is just growing bigger in the whole repack situation because it's an inflated price because people can sort of get into it for a lot, you know, cheaper than they could maybe buying the single itself for the chase of that product. But then sort of everything else is you're basically paying 300 bucks, 400 bucks, $1,000 and getting a hundred dollar card back. It's like that gap is huge. And that gap is going to keep getting bigger because the person now, you know, that has that, you know, $1,000 hit to their pocket is going to sell it to someone else. And then a repacker is going to buy it. And it's just going to keep building. Like I said, so I'm going on a, I'm going on a tangent now, but back to what, you know, Mike said in that stream with um, cage lawyer, where he talked about maybe Fnatic is already doing something in the background to try and preempt the fact that the government's going to come in and look at this at some stage. And I will reiterate, I think you are really naive if you think it's not going to happen. Like, I don't think it's going to happen, but I think there's a greater chance of regulation coming in when it comes to whatnot and Fnatic's live than there's not. And I, I, I'm very confident about that purely because of the lens that's being placed on the hobby right now. But, you know, Mike sort of mentioned that maybe Fnatic is already doing things in the background, but I'm not sure how good that's going to be for them. Because if you look at, you know, Fnatic's live right now and whatnot, there's no real vetting to sign up to the process in the first place, right? They're not really doing anything to sort of prove that you are who you are. You know, you can just get a fake phone number or go get your mum's phone number and sign up. And then meanwhile, you're a kid, you know, gambling away. But at the same sort of time, if they are actively trying to do something, how good is it going to look for them to the regulator and say, well, we thought regulation was coming. We're going to build all this functionality into our app and we're going to start vetting it when you tell us to. But in the meantime, when we go to these rip nights, we're going to give kids credits to buy into our app. And that's basically what's also happening. When you go and look at these rip nights, kids are getting packs on the night that have a $10 credit in there whatever it was for Fnatic's Live, which is insane to me because you're incentivizing kids to use a platform that is incentivizing gambling. And you can say, okay, maybe that credit was only for buying new product or buying singles. But that you know platform, that app is sort of a gateway into jumping into breaking and all this sort of other stuff. So again, it's just a very you know muddy situation. I don't think Fnatic is doing things on one hand and then you know doing this as well. Maybe they are, but that looks pretty piss poor to me in my opinion, if that is in fact what they're doing. Now, Mike didn't say that's what they were doing. He was sort of saying that's what I think they're maybe trying to do in the background or it wouldn't surprise me if they were. And Mike did say that he wants to have a chat with me on a live and have a bit of a debate on topics like this. I haven't had the time yet. I've got a newborn, like I said, so it's been pretty hectic. I only get the 10, 15 minutes to record these to step away here and there. So it's going to be hard to line something up in the next week or so, but we'll sort of see how it goes because it'll be good to chat through that. But it's just a it's just an interesting one, you know, when you factor all that sort of stuff in, like, could, you know, regulation come in and then kill this hobby overnight? And I, I think it could. And that sounds very scary, like I said. But when you think about the things I just mentioned about how all these, you know, repackers are, you know, a huge piece of liquidity for this industry. They're going to shows and buying up all this stuff. If a barrier to entry comes in, meaning that they now need to have certain things in place to be able to break on these platforms, to be able to sell repacks in the first place or to do certain things, or, you know, the vetting process of these apps has to change where they now have to actually prove that you're over 21 in the US, 18 here in Australia, that's going to be a huge you know, issue for these guys. You know, How many of them are going to disappear overnight as a result of that? And what does that mean for card prices long-term? That's what we sort of need to be keeping in mind when we see all this sort of stuff. And yes, you know, buying into a repack is very different um, to traditional gambling because you are guaranteed to get something. But it's just one of those things where it's just very tricky. And it's one of those things that we need to be watching quite closely because I think it it's a better chance of than not of happening. And I'm rambling quite a lot now, but I really want to hear what you guys have to say down in down below because repackers are integral to Fnatic's Live. They are integral to whatnot. They are integral to this sports card industry as we currently know it. And they're providing a lot of liquidity. They're bringing a lot of money in. They're helping people sell stuff quickly. What does that mean long-term? 
The other piece to think about on that, just off that thought is, you know, you're not only going to risk maybe repackers leaving the platform or making it harder to sell things on their platform. The people that are out at shows that are selling inventory, that are being able to spend quite excessively because they know in the worst case, they're buying decent stuff. Repackers are probably going to come and get it. They're probably going to get their money back or make a little bit of a profit. That's sort of guaranteed for them. If that disappears for them too, it's like a domino effect because not only are you going to have maybe less people getting access to these apps, which means less repacks being sold and less money coming into the hobby, it's going to be the people that are currently in the hobby having less of an opportunity to sell, which means they're going to buy less and then less and less and less. And then it basically spirals down to the point of, well, people are basically stuck holding cards that are not worth the money. Their wives start you know, hitting them over the back of the head saying, what the heck did they do? And all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of mess like that. And like I said, I've said a few times now, it does very much sound like doom and gloom, but it's just an important one. And I think, again, is the biggest threat to sports card collecting as we currently know. You know, go out there, buy singles, have fun, all that sort of stuff, but keep an eye on this sort of thing. Repacks should scare you a lot more than they are right now, in my opinion. But, you know, it is what it is. Thanks for watching, guys. I rambled quite a lot. I do apologize. Like I said, I haven't had time to shave or anything. The new baby's keeping me very freaking busy, but I'm having fun. I'll try and catch up with Mike on Instagram Live in the next week or two. It's really hard to line up at the moment, guys. Those of you that have a newborn or had kids in the past will know exactly what I'm talking about. The first week has been pretty much hell, but we're getting there. It is what it is. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.